So I want to introduce Dr. Paul Curtin. Paul is a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at, uh, at Mayo Clinic. And uh, Paul is just a superb diagnostic hematopathologist in both lymph nodes and bone marrows. He's the one, he's the person, he's the gray hair guy that we go to when we have problem cases. So, um, and, and Paul has been very instrumental in us uh, really uh, helping us uh, determine and build this algorithmic and guideline type process. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Curtin. Thank you. Th thanks for that overly kind introduction, Kurt. And thank you all for coming. Thanks for the organizers of this uh, set of uh, Friday satellite symposiums for choosing uh, our c course again this year. I think we were helpful to people last year, and we're really happy that you all came. So thank you so much for spending a Friday morning with us. Um, I'm going to start out talking about, um, sorry, I'm going to start talking about um, test utilization in the context of staging bone marrows in patients who have malignant lymphoma. And of course, I have no relevant disclosures. Um, it has become clear that bone marrows done for staging of lymphomas um, usually are performed after you know that the patient has um, malignant lymphoma. So we know these are cancers of the immune system cells. We know that there are many types with a complex classification based on morphology, phenotype, and genetics. We know that um, they are diagnosed and classified primarily on the basis of lymph node biopsies or other uh, non-nodal sites, but usually the bone marrow is not the primary site of diagnosis for malignant lymphoma. Bone marrow evaluations in this context are usually performed to determine the extent of the stage, uh, sta extent of disease, and the typical evaluation in the United States has become morphology, flow cytometry, cytogenetics, with and without fish, on every bone marrow performed for staging malignant lymphomas. As Kurt says, you can achieve a rather large savings if you don't particularly take this approach. And what I'd like to go with you, uh, through with you today is some data that we've generated from our practice and from other practices that actually address the question, does flow cytometry, does cytogenetics, does FISH, does molecular analysis add in helpful information in determining whether or not a bone marrow is involved by malignant lymphoma? So we'll start out with this. What test would you order on this particular bone marrow specimen? The patient is a 64-year-old female who has cervical axillary and inguinal adenopathy. A lymph node biopsy was performed, and then the bone marrow was performed for staging two days after the lymph node biopsy, and there's really no other relevant prior history in this patient. This is the morphology of the lymph node specimen. In the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that the architecture of the node is effaced by an abnormal population of lymphocytes growing in a distinctly nodular pattern. The nodules become uh, coalescent as they efface the uh, architecture. Within the nodules is a monomorphous population of small lymphoid cells that have irregular grooved and cleaved nuclear contours, partly clumped chromatin, inconspicuous nucleoli, and sparse pale staining cytoplasm. This is typical morphology of follicular lymphoma grade one. Immunophenotypically, these cells had a, a germinal center B-cell phenotype. They expressed pan B-cell markers like CD19 and CD20. They were positive for the germinal center B-cell markers, BCL6 and CD10. They abnormally expressed BCL2. The nodules were associated with CD21 positive follicular dendritic cell meshworks, and there were relatively small numbers of non neoplastic CD3 positive T cells in the background. So, this is a very typical case of follicular lymphoma grade one. This is the test menu for the bone marrow. That's what the clinician ordered. Flow cytometry was ordered both on blood um, and bone marrow, and this is the way the bone marrow morphology looked. The Bone marrow had intertrabecular and paratrabecular aggregates of abnormal lymphocytes that effaced the underlying bone marrow architecture, and the aggregates were comp composed of cells that were cytologically identical to those present in the lymph node specimen. So this looked pretty involved um, to me, without a whole lot of other effort. So what about flow cytometry in the context of staging bone marrow specimens? Well, we, made, we did a study, Kurt actually uh, did this study several years ago now, and the assumptions going into it were that the patient had a lymphoma diagnosis and classification that was based on a tissue other than the bone marrow, 
that the bone marrow was performed subsequent to the lymphoma diagnosis for staging, not for primary diagnosis, and that we had performed bilateral bone marrow biopsies with at least two linear centimeters of uh, bone marrow that we could examine morphologically. Our questions were, does routine flow cytometry of B-cell lymphoma staging samples add information about the presence or absence of lymphoma or about the lymphoma classification in the specimen? For this study, we had 175 cases that we were able to um, have both flow cytometry and good morphology and good uh, clear-cut diagnostic material on the pre-bone marrow uh, diagnostic specimen. And in 91% of cases, 150 of them, there was complete concordance between the morphology and the flow cytometry results. That is, if the morphology was positive, the flow was positive. If the morphology was negative, the flow was negative. And there were a few non-concordant cases, only 8.6% or 15 cases. And we'll dive down a little bit deeper into what those were about. First, in the flow cytometry negative, morphology positive cases, there were five patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with what has been termed discordant bone marrow involvement. So there was diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in the non-bone marrow specimen, and there was a lower-grade lymphoma in the bone marrow biopsy specimen. This is not an uncommon finding in patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And there were five patients who had follicular lymphoma in the tissue with bone marrow involvement. All involvements were focal, and all were positive by immunohistochemistry, so we were pretty sure that this morphology-positive bone marrows really were, and that flow cytometry was a false negative in these cases. Because of the focal involvement, it's very likely that the flow is negative because the aspirate didn't sample the specimen, uh, did, not, did not sample the lymphoma uh, for the um, flow cytometry specimen. There were five patients who had morphology-negative bone marrows and five uh, and, and flow cytometry positive bone marrows. They all had low level disease by flow cytometry. All were negative by immunohistochemistry, so by neither morphology nor immunohistochemistry directly performed on the tissue samples could we detect lymphoma. All the patients had diffuse large B cell lymphoma. All had widespread bulky disease. And in the two cases that we were able to study peripheral blood, all had peripheral blood involvement by flow cytometry. Our study is very similar to others uh, that are performed in the literature in terms of the concordance and discordance rates, in terms of the morphology positive flow cytometry negative discordance due to focal disease, the flow cytometry positive morphology negative discordance appears to be more frequent in diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients. It's associated with bulky disease and probable peripheral blood involvement. And so we think that what's really going on here is that the flow cytometry specimen that's been uh, aspirated from the bone marrow has been contaminated by peripheral blood that's actually involved by lymphoma. And the significance of this finding across uh, many studies now has been uncertain because it has little apparent effect on prognosis in these patients. What about, um, so our recommendations for flow cytometry and bone marrow staging samples is that we collect specimens. We perform it only if there's uncertainty from the pathology perspective once we've reviewed the slides. And given the false negative rate of flow cytometry and focally involved bone marrows, we would consider using immunohistochemistry as a diagnostic modality rather than flow cytometry in this instance. Um, given this, we cancel flow cytometry on all morphologically negative and unequivocally positive cases, and I would say that we cancel flow cytometry in over 80%, 80% of our um, routine staging bone marrows for lymphoma, uh, with no apparent adverse effect on patient outcome. Now, what about cytogenetics? We did a similar study with cytogenetic analysis. Our assumptions were similar to those with the uh, flow cytometry study. We assumed that the lymphoma was diagnosed on a tissue other than the bone marrow, that the bone marrow was involved for staging, not for primary diagnosis, and our questions were similar too. Does routine karyotype of lymphoma bone marrow specimens add information about the presence or absence of lymphoma or about the lymphoma classification or about other diseases that might also be present in the bone marrow? We started with 575, uh, 574 patients who had a lymphoma diagnosis based on a tissue biopsy other than bone marrow. 298 of them had a contemporaneous bone marrow, so that is within one month subsequent to the lymphoma diagnosis in the, um, in the lymph node um, specimen. And of that 298, 112 specimens uh, had cytogenetics performed on them, and those then became our study group. Of the 112 cases on which cytogenetics was performed, 41 specimens were involved by malignant lymphoma. Of those 41 involved bone marrows, 32 had normal routine karyotypes. 
and only nine had abnormal genetics. And the karyotypes in the abnormal genetic cases were exactly what you'd expect knowing the lymphoma type. So if the patient had follicular lymphoma, we demonstrated a 14-18 translocation in the bone marrow. If the patient had mantle cell lymphoma, we demonstrated an 11-14 translocation um, in the bone marrow. So not only was cytogenetics relatively poor at sensitively detecting bone marrow involvement by lymphoma, it also didn't add additional information relative to the lymphoma type that happened to involve the bone marrow. In the 71 cases that were negative for lymphoma by morphology and selective phenotyping, nine had abnormal genetics. And here is a breakdown of those nine cases. Two of the patients had follicular lymphoma focally involving the bone marrow, and there was a single metaphase um, abnormality. And single metaphase abnormalities is the um, theme for these other cases as well. As you know, the cytogenetic definition of a clone requires greater than two metaphases with cytogenetic abnormalities. So you cannot use these abnormalities diagnostically in any way relative to the detection of lymphoma in these particular specimens. Three of the patients were elderly males who had loss of chromosome Y, which is a common finding in elderly males and does not have pathogenetic significance. One of the patients had, was a heavily treated follicular lymphoma patient who developed a post-therapy acute myeloid leukemia, and in this particular uh, case, the karyotype uh, was consistent with a post-therapy acute leukemia with ad chromosome 5 and deletion of chromosome 7. And finally, the last patient had diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with a karyotype that was considered to be a constitutional karyotype and was not clinically significant. Now, uh, for the there were several bone marrow cases that were negative for lymphoma, but in which the patients had potential for myeloid disorders. And uh, karyotypes were infrequently helpful um, in determining what was going on with the myeloid disorder. In one patient who had pancytopenia and dyserythropoiesis, deletion 7Q was found, which supported the diagnosis of a therapy-related myelodysplasia. There was one patient who had concurrent polycythemia vera, and that's a common karyotype abnormality in P. vera. And then there was our patient with AML post-therapy, the follicular lymphoma patient, who had a karyotype that went along with that diagnosis. So our conclusions were that cytogenetics does not improve the sensitivity for detection of lymphoma um, in involvement of the bone marrow over and above morphology and selected immunophenotyping. Cytogenetics usually adds no useful information about lymphoma-positive bone marrows, about the type of lymphoma, because that's already been established on the pre-bone marrow diagnostics lymphoma specimen. Abnormal cytogenetics and morphologically normal specimens are usually of doubtful significance. Abnormal cytogenetics can support the diagnosis of a myeloid neoplasm in this context. And we routinely perform pre-transplant, pre-autotransplant uh, cytogenetics in order to exclude the possibility of morphologically occult myelodysplastic syndromes. We had similar findings with fish. And I won't go through these in any detail. The slides are in your handout. But in essence, the conclusions regarding fish and detection of lymphoma by fish and deciding on lymphoma type by fish in already known lymphoma patients when the bone marrow is done for staging uh, are also not, is not a particularly helpful uh, exercise. T cell and immunoglobulin gene rearrangements uh, are also frequently performed in this context. You know that clonal T cell receptor gene rearrangements are present in about 90% of T cell lineage lymphomas and leukemias that a clonal present, uh, pattern can be present in a variable percentage of reactive conditions, particularly in blood and bone marrow and elderly individuals. There's approximately a 10% um, positivity rate for PCR detection of clonal T cell receptor gene rearrangements in normal older adults as a result of contraction of the immune repertory that occurs in these individuals. Non-clonal patterns are typically associated with lymphoid hyperplasias. Um, so T cell receptor gene rearrangements suffer from problems with specificity. Immunoglobulin gene rearrangements have a clonal rearrangement pattern in approximately 90% of B cell lineage malignant lymphoma and leukemia specimens. The clonal pattern is rare in reactive conditions, so the specificity of a clonal immunoglobulin gene rearrangement for a B cell malignancy is higher than the corresponding um, sensitivity or specificity for T cell rearrangements. And non-clonal patterns are typically observed in lymphoid hyperplasias. So we looked at our practice data regarding clinician-ordered immunoglobulin gene rearrangements on bone marrows. We had a total of 47 cases over a year period. 14 patients had a clonal uh, pattern, but the morphology and flow cytometry clearly indicated a malignant B-cell uh, neoplasm in all, making the immunoglobulin gene rearrangement results superfluous in these cases. 33 of them had non-clonal patterns, 
and they were performed in cases that included um, myeloid neoplasms, uh, a T-cell malignancy, and in 29 normal bone marrows. So we thought that all of the immunoglobulin gene arrangement studies that were performed on these specimens were unnecessary. Our sensitivity and specificity data regarding T-cell receptor gene arrangements on bone marrow is similar. We had a total of 172 cases with 22 true positive results. That means if the gene arrangement was positive, the patient had a T-cell T -cell malignancy. We had 19 false positive results, which is 11% of the total cohort and is exactly what you'd expect based on the data about positive gene arrangements in normal individuals. We had 12 false negative results. Uh, we used Biomed 2 primers, so this really wasn't a problem with the, uh, the typical type of uh, analytical technique that we use for T-cell receptor gene rearrangements. So these are patients who had negative T-cell negative receptor gene rearrangements, but clearly had bone marrows involved by lymphoma. And then we had 121 unnecessary studies. So when we uh, reviewed these data with our clinicians, this was their comment. And our recommendations is don't do them unless you have a specific pathology problem that you want to, uh, want to solve. So the summary of the test utilization principles approved by the clinical and uh, lymphoma group are that we obtain specimens for flow cytometry, routine cytogenetics, fish and molecular genetics on lymphoma staging bone marrow specimens, and we s forward them for these analyses only when there's a particular pathology problem that, is, um, that, that needs to be resolved based on the morphology and the history. We'd cancel all other uh, tests, and we report which tests were canceled or forwarded for um, uh, testing. So if we perform the test, there's a note on the bottom of our reports that said we did it. If we cancel the test, there's a note on the report that said we didn't do it. And we also save specimens so that we can retrospectively go back and do the analyses if a subsequent um, uh, clinical information tells us that we probably should have done it to begin with. So there's a fail-safe built into uh, the way we handle these specimens. So in our case, our morphologically involved bone marrow, with those tests ordered by the clinician, that's really all that was needed in order to definitively diagnose lymphoma.